I would like to introduce Dr. Mo Tabib. She and her research team are go, uh, have done a study on exploring midwives' experiences of an emotional intelligence EI program, a qualitative study. I'm going to mute and take off my video, but know that I am here and you can chat uh, as well. Thank you, Megan, for uh, the introduction. And hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here and have a good, lovely variety of audience from all different parts of the world. Um, and thank you to the BIDM organizers. I really appreciate the opportunity that has been given to me to share um, this research with the audience. And also thanks to audience for their presence and their attention. So the study that I'm presenting to you today starts with doing is never enough if being is neglected. This qualitative study explored midwives' experiences of participating um, uh, in an emotional intelligence program. And as Megan um, has kindly said, the research team included myself and Dr. Forbes McCoy, who's a psychologist, and Professor Tracy Humphrey from University of South Australia. Next, please. So it's well known that midwifery is emotionally demanding. We know many midwives experience high levels of stress, anxiety, burnout, and unfortunately a great number of them even consider actually leaving the profession. This is really of you know, great concern to our profession, to midwives' well-being, and as a result can have actually serious implications also for the quality of maternity care the midwives provide. So the existing evidence suggests one of the major contributing factors to this problem is the conflict between midwives' aspiration of truly being with the woman, connecting with her, supporting her on one hand, and the institutional expectations of the role on the other hand, which is mainly focused on the doing aspects of the job. So being mentally and emotionally present to a woman's psychological needs whilst also meeting the institutional demands requires a high level of emotional intelligence, or as they say, EI. Now, evidence suggests there is a strong link between high emotional intelligence levels and a sustainable midwifery workforce, because we already know EI is positively linked to well-being has an inverse relationship with the stress, emotional exhaustion, and burnout in health professionals generally. And the good news is that the research also shows that EI can be learned and increased through relevant education. So for example, research on a population such as nursing or medical students is really promising, but there is a paucity of evidence on midwives' experiences of such education. Next, please, Megan, thank you. So as such, the aim of our study was to explore midwives' experiences of an EI education program. But before we go to the study, I really want to kind of discuss what I mean by EI. I'm sure you have heard EI previously, but let's have a look at the definition of it first, Megan. Next, please. So, Daniel Goldman, the father of emotional intelligence, defines AI as the ability to recognize and manage one's own emotions, recognize the emotions in others, and manage relationships effectively. But to gain a bit more insight in what AI actually meant also in our study, and in general actually, let's use a practical example here. Can I ask you to have a pen and paper in hand, please? Just I give you a second if that's okay, because I'm going to ask you to take some brief notes. Thank you. So now I'm going to invite you to think about a recent experience that perhaps was a slightly negative, 
sorry, that's not a <laughs> good reminder, but I hope that actually benefits of this exercise would be more than, you know, the disadvantage of reminding ourselves of, ourselves <clears throat> of the negative emotions. So think about maybe an experience that is not too overwhelming, maybe something that happened and as a result you felt annoyed or a bit, a bit frustrated or upset maybe. I give you a minute to look for just one experience that caused such emotions. <clears throat> Can I ask you to use the <clears throat> raise hand um, icon? at the bottom of the page, if you've already found one experience. I can't see how many hands we have, Megan, would you be able to tell me? <clears throat> um, it looks like two hands, including my own right now. I don't Should I just give you some more time to just think of something really, you know, it doesn't have to be something major, but something that, you know, maybe recently happened and you felt a little bit mm, annoyed or frustrated or upset about it. So that's, that's really interesting because I usually, with this exercise, almost every hand goes up. And so that means you're an exceptional population of very happy people. <laughs> that's good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for raising your hands. So usually, actually, it's really easy to find those sorts of experiences. And... If you found an experience, I'm sure if, even if it's not like a recent experience, it could be, you know, something that happened maybe in the past. I'm, I'm sure we all have experiences like that. Um, so can I ask you to take yourself to that experience? Imagine actually you're there and just imagine what you can see, perhaps what you can hear, the sounds, maybe people who are around you, the objects, the colors. Would that be okay? But more importantly, I'm going to invite you to notice the mental comments you had in your head then, or the thoughts. You know, one example could be, for example, you know, why why is this happening to me? So, yeah, if you don't mind, just take a note of, you know, those thoughts. And if you feel comfortable enough to share maybe these thoughts with the group, you are a small group, hopefully you should, you should feel safe enough. Do you want to just, yeah, write a little note in the chat box saying that actually, what were those thoughts? Would be good to have a few examples of what happens to us actually all the time as human beings. Defensiveness. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. So yeah, just kind of what, what, were you saying in your head about the experience? So for example, I give you an example of my own experience. So, so somebody says something and I think, you know, or I find it, let's say offensive, just as an example. And in my head, what the mental comments I'm making, you know, is that, you know, for example, how could you say that? How dare you? Or <laughs> why would you say such a thing? You know, those sorts of things that's actually kind of the mental comments that the ch chattering box that we all have in our head. So I can see a few things coming up. Um, or to accept, yeah, just not accept, you know, why? Why is it this, this happening to me? Or why this person is saying such a thing? Thank you. And usually, you know, when we have, when we have those mental comments, um, 
as a result of those mental comments, there's, there are some chemicals released actually in our body, as we all know, as midwives call them, you know, mostly hormones. These chemicals would cause us certain sensations in our body. We call that an emotion. So emotions basically are the reflection of our thoughts. Thoughts, let's say, happening in the mind, in the head, and the emotions happening in the body. So can you, again, take a note of the emotions that you felt in that experience? Again, it would be great to share. I think Katrin has already shared like defensiveness. Maybe that's an emotion or maybe not. So do you mind just sharing, again, the emotion you felt in that experience that you chose for yourself? Fear, anxiety, tempted to respond verbally, frustration. Thank you very much for your participation. Now I'm going to ask you, apologies for that, but go back again to the experience. This time, and anger, thanks, Catherine. This time, I'm going to ask you if that's okay, ask you to close your eyes. Why am I asking you this? Because that would help us to focus better on the experience. So try to feel what you felt then during that experience. Again, just pay attention to what you can see. Maybe people, objects, images. Hear what you could hear at the time. Perhaps Feel the tension in your body, in different parts of the body. And now I'm going to invite you to take a deep, a slow breath in. And as you breathe out slowly, allow your breath to flow over your face, maybe your eyelids, your cheeks, your jaw, your neck. And if you notice any tension in this area, if you can, just let go of the tension. Maybe on the next out breath, just pay attention to the sensations in your shoulders, in your arms and hands. One more deep breath in, and as you breathe out, allow the breath to flow over your whole body, your core, your maybe thighs, knees, calves, and your feet. Right? Thank you. And now, with the next out breath, please in your mind's eyes, imagine you're stepping back from that experience. Just one step back and another one, and maybe a few more, creating some space between you and the experience. And again, observe your thoughts. It's those mental comments. Observe your feelings and the sensation in your body from a little bit of distance this time. Now see what happens if you just acknowledge them. That's how you're, you know, feeling. And these are the thoughts that you are having right now. Accept them. Whatever they are. Perhaps saying to yourself, there they are, and here I am. You just observe them from distance without judgment or any comments or reactions. Just observe them neutrally, maybe, quietly. And then allow the thoughts, the feelings to float away as the white clouds float away in the blue sky, just letting go, watching them floating away and realizing that you are not your thoughts and emotions. You are not the clouds, you are the blue sky behind. And thoughts and emotions come and go, they pass, they always pass. Whilst the blue sky, you remains still. So whenever it feels comfortable to you, you can open your eyes and bring your attention back to our virtual room. 
So those of you who manage to actually participate in the, if you don't have a very busy maybe environment and you have managed to participate in the exercise, just wanted to see actually if anything happened after this, you know, any changes happening to your bodily sensations or your thoughts or emotions at all. It would be good to just get a bit of feedback if you don't mind. <clears throat> You can either use the chat box or perhaps if Megan doesn't mind just turning your microphone on. <laughs> That's great, Catherine. The sense of relief and knowledge, acknowledgement that we are not the thoughts, we are not our feelings. Thank you, Megan. So, yeah, the aim of actually inviting you to this exercise was to bring a little, you show you how we can bring a bit more awareness to our thoughts and emotion, you know, and the patterns that we have of them. Because on average, we go through this pattern of thinking about something and as a result, feeling an emotion in our body, something around 60,000 times per day. So I was a little surprised that some of us couldn't actually think of <laughs> negative experiences. And unfortunately, around 80% of these thought emotion patterns are negative in an average person. So back to the definition of EI, that uh, the emotional intelligence um, at the beginning of this exercise uh, I mentioned, self-awareness is the foundation of emotional intelligence. And it is to become actually the silent observer of these patterns. Therefore, thoughts and emotions would lose their seriousness, their power over us. So then we can manage our emotions better and have a calmer mind in general. This calmer mind then would allow us to notice emotions in other people better. As a result, we feel what they feel, or we become a bit more empathetic. And the more we feel other people's emotions, the more we want to help. That's the concept of compassion. So hopefully that is, has given you like a taste of what emotional intelligence meant in the EI, the EI program that we use in this study. Next, please. So the emotional intelligence education offered in this study was a four month program delivered over six group sessions, total of 24 hours of education, and we use the combination of in-person and online sessions. Next, please. So EIP or Emotional Intelligence Program included theoretical learning and relaxation practices, a little bit similar to what I shared with you, but obviously much more than that as well. <laughs> In classes, midwives practice applying these skills in their midwifery practice and also for women in their care using case-based learning, so, and scenarios and simulated situations. And then they had these three big gaps between the session that would allow them to actually implement the learned skills in real world, either in you know, personal life or in the practice for women in their care again, reflect on their experiences and bring these reflections back to the next session sharing with the group. Next, please. So the study took a descriptive qualitative approach, focus group interviews were used uh, for data collection and the data were analyzed using reflexive thematic analysis. Next, please. The study was carried out in a Scottish health ward where midwives from five community teams were recruited. Next, please. And 
15 midwives actually participated in the education of whom 13 agreed to participate in the research. All were females aged between 23 to 58. They were from five both rural and urban midwifery community teams. And they had uh, between one and 30 years of work experience as a midwife. Next, please. So what did we find? So I'm going to share the findings with you. But before then, I would just like to kind of highlight that the names that I've used in the next slides are all pseudonyms. And these are the names that actually were chosen by the participants themselves. So they are not real names. Next, please. <clears throat> So the overarching theme was the ripple effect. Bev said, the one thing about relaxation, I would say, is the ripple effect of it. It has a massive ripple effect that you aren't even aware of, and it can go beyond what you expect. Next, please. This ripple effect included three themes uh, and starting by influencing me and my relationship at, at its heart, which then led to taking a different approach to practice and ultimately to feelings of confidence and empowerment in their role as midwives. Next, please. And as you can see, each of these three themes uh, had some sub themes that we are going to look at in the next slides. Next, please. So the first sub theme of the first theme was me as a person. Uh, for some of the midwives, the influence of the program on themselves came as a surprise. Uh, for example, Veronica said, I thought it was more going to be based on having to deliver a session to women through all kinds of childbirth spectrum. And Yvonne added, I'm surprised at how helpful it was for me as a person, as well as me as a midwife. Next, please. Thank you. So... Selena, so, so that they basically said, you know, this led to developing self-awareness and self-management. And Selena said, yeah, just develop the greater self-awareness, just differentiating between the thinker and the observer. It's made me a calmer person rather than getting stressed has helped me change as a person to see things differently, not overthinking as much and just take a breath and calm down. So self-awareness actually meant learning to shift the one's question, uh, focus from habitual thinking to becoming that observer of the thinking mind, the patterns. This shift seemed to have a stress reduction effect on midwives. Next, please. <clears throat> So they provided some examples of how they manage their emotions, including the, the managing their emotion in highly stressful clinical situations. So for example, Selena said, actually she was a midwife working in a, a standalone midwifery unit uh, that was uh, around like 45 minutes drive from the nearest um, tertiary hospital. So she said she was having late decelerations and so, that initial panic, thinking about so many things in my head. My uncle midwife was 45 minutes away and I knew ambulances were always going to be an issue. So it was just that kind of initial panic, but then taking that a step back and I've never experienced anything like that before. It was a really strong feeling where I felt like I was almost out with my body looking at the situation and just telling myself, all right, this is what you need to do. And this is the order you need to do it in. It's just taking that a step back from being the thinker to become the observer and dealing with the situation. Thank you, next. So the self-awareness also seemed to have an enhancing effect on their relationships with their family, with their colleagues and women in their care as well. 
And they explained how this actually happened. Um, Neve said, it's just made me more aware of like how I'm coming across. And Amanda added, because you can relax yourself, then we are a lot more open to taking more time for other people and really <clears throat> taking on what they're saying. I think if you come across more open and relaxed, they're a lot more willing to divulge things to you, whether that be like a staff or women. And Beth said, it changed my relationships with my younger, youngest daughter. That's a winner for me, that she's managed to break through that, to talk to me about her emotions. <clears throat> Next, please. They suggested this helped them to adopt a culture of presence in workplace. Veronica suggested, I think in the NHS, we definitely have a culture of just keep going attitude, keep going on to the next shift, onto the next clinic. It's just given me an opportunity to make the most of little pockets of time, just taking five minutes or 10, just with the woman, explore how she's feeling and go into that a bit deeper as maybe what I would have done before, just taking that moment together. Next, please. They actually utilize their skills in practice in a very kind of innovative ways. And um, this one was one of them. So Nick said, I had this couple come in for the first appointment and they'd had a really negative experience with her first baby. He was really angry. They came in the room like completely standoffish. I was really stressed. So I started thinking about the breathing techniques and I thought I'd just be quiet for a few minutes. It felt like forever, but just sat, relax my shoulders, listen. And after about five minutes, that atmosphere completely changed. I've never had that before. They were like laughing and like fine by the time that they left. It completely changed the whole experience. And I thought that's because of that course I've been on. Thank you. Next one, please. And sometimes they use the techniques for women with, for example, needle phobia when performing membrane sweeps for women with high blood pressure and also in latent phase of labor. For example, this is one of the experiences that Jude had. She said she had a long latent phase and said, I just don't want to go home. I'm too scared. I said, do you want to try some relaxation? I think doing that little relaxation with her made her more relaxed and reaffirmed that she could do it at home. Then she did go home and came back four hours later, fully dilated where she was only one centimeter when she went home. Yeah, it worked. She just needed that confidence to do it herself. Next, please. As a result of observing these kind of um, experiences and outcomes for women, midwives felt empowered and more confident in their own role. Amanda said, it's just kind of given me that belief in my role and the power that we have as midwives. And Selena said, and the difference we can make to somebody's experience, taking it from something that can potentially be very negative to turn that around to making it a positive experience and helping them cope and manage, and Nina added, and yourself as well. Next, please. So overall, the study suggests that emotional intelligence program may enhance midwife's emotional well-being in two ways. First, by learning stress management skills, which help them become more self-aware and have a calmer mind, and therefore becoming like more able to understand emotions in other people. So in other words, you can say midwives are suggesting self-awareness help them to become more empathetic and the second uh, way was by actually having the skills to alleviate emotional distress in women 
and making a difference in the quality of the care they provided seem to also enhance midwife's well-being. So when they actually notice what they were doing was making a difference, a positive difference in women's experiences, that had an impact on midwife's confidence and therefore their well-being. Next, please. So the study had some strengths and some limitations. Um, to the best of our knowledge, it was the very first qualitative study exploring midwife's experiences of an emotional intelligence program. And the diversity of participants in terms of age, seniority, and workplace also was a strand. On the other hand, we interviewed a small number of participants, which is, I think, the inherent kind of um, weakness of qualitative studies, maybe. Um, although we can argue that, you know, qualitative studies are not about generalizability or more about, you know, the experiences of people. It was carried out on a single study site, just one NHS health board, and we recruited only community midwives. So these are the limitations of the study. Next, please. So our conclusion is that, um, before I actually read the conclusion, I just wanted to say, we also did a pilot survey study, a quantitative study, a small one though, with 14 midwives. And we measure treat emotional intelligence and mental well-being using validated questionnaires before the uh, attending the course and immediately after completing the course. And uh, both of these parameters in significantly increase after attending the program. So in conclusion of both these studies, we feel the equipping midwives with emotional management skills may improve their emotional well-being, their experiences of practice, and potentially the quality of the care they provide for those in their care. And therefore, implementation of evidence-based EI education in midwifery undergraduate curriculum and midwife CPD should be considered. And we are currently actually our research team are we are seeking for funding opportunities for carrying out more um, larger kind of so this is larger sample size, and we are looking for uh, research partners also for this. Next, please. So this is the yeah. So what we are planning to do is just doing large scale multi center the studies. Um, that are needed. So we're hoping to um, hopefully have the opportunity to carry those studies maybe with research partners um, so that we can actually assess and investigate the effectiveness of evidence-based EI education, both on well-being of current and future, future midwifery workforce, and also the um, maternity care quality. And the next, uh, thank you, Megan. The next slide uh, is a QR code that would take you to the article that was just published in Women and Bath Journal. So if you're interested to know more about program or the study itself, you know, that would take you to that an open access um, journal article that's just been published. And the next one, please. This is my email address. So if you have you know, questions that you may want to ask later on, or you're interested in any, you know, um, partnership, working together, collaboration, please just contact me. Um